From a deep fabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, the history and origins of scurvy. And now, the podcast host who always ensures his pirate friends have plenty of vitamin C, Pete Dominic. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Pete Co. And yeah, unfortunately, the whole interview I did with the expert on the history of scurvy, my mic was like totally corrupted, Pete. I, I really messed that up. And boy, uh, Dr. Michaels was his name. He was really on top of some things with swollen, bleeding gums and uh, previously healed wounds. It was really something else, but we are, unfortunately, I lost it. But I do have two great conversations joining me today. When it comes to the labor movement, there's almost nobody in media I'd rather talk to than Rick Smith of The Rick Smith Show. He joins me first. And then when it comes to gerrymandering, redistricting, and politics in general, I always love to talk to Dave Daly, former editor-in-chief of Salon.com, author of a whole bunch of books, working on his third book, where apparently it took him to Virginia to the door of Justice uh, Anthony Kennedy, the former Supreme Court justice. He went and knocked on his door, and he tells me all about it. So you're not going to want to miss either, either of these interviews. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much for subscribing with a paid subscription. If you haven't signed up yet, do it now. StandUpWithPete.com. Join us tonight for the watch party for the January 6th hearings. We're going to watch them tonight together live. We'll chat. We'll talk. It'll be fun. Well, maybe I'll get some special guests. Hope to see you there. And this Saturday, Fairfield, Connecticut, Ophir Eisenberg, Christian at Finnegan, and me, Pete Dominic. We will all be performing at the Fairfield Comedy Club. Tickets in the show notes. Okay. Wow. How you doing? How you feeling? How's it going? Where you at? Where you at physically and mentally and emotionally? And are you present? And are you seeing the thoughts you're having? Are you replacing the negative thoughts with positive ones? Are you taking positive actions whenever you can? I got a great text from my cousin Darcy, smart cousin Darcy, who I grew up looking up to. She went to Cornell. She worked for Special Olympics. She's brilliant. Her husband is brilliant, David. And anyway, She just said that she does not miss the news. She was someone who always loved the news segment, but she said that you're helping me adjust my mentality about the news. Listening to Bill Boyle means I can read the news with a different lens or even read less of it. Listening to your intro and hearing a focus on positive action around issues rather than just more doom and gloom. It's healthy and it's good. She said, it's just so hard right now. So heavy. As you have said, we have to think about how to engage with the news. And you are both framing current events in terms of action we can take and providing a helpful lens on how to digest the headlines. It feels good to me. I really liked what you did before, but now I scan the headlines for about five minutes and then choose a few podcasts that go deep and or focus on positive action. And mostly you are the one I listen to that is doing more of the latter. And I'm starting my day with more positivity. Well, smart cousin Darcy, that just about does it. Thank you so much for those thoughtful texts and for everybody else who is staying with me through the changes here on the show as I try to do just that. Start your day with a little bit more positivity, maybe with some good news. I'll still share a few top stories or maybe undercover stories, and we'll see what this develops into So keep the suggestions coming and the support. I can't get enough of that. Your verbal support means everything to me as well. Whatever you're thinking about the show, stand up with Pete at gmail.com. All right. Just a couple of headlines here at the top. It is day 505 of the Biden presidency and things are looking bleak for old Joe Biden at the moment. His approval rating, his net approval ratings have hit an all time low worse than Donald Trump's at the same point in his presidency. It's such a false equivalency. And it's such a shame and has so much to do with, I think, inflation, gas prices, the cost of things more than everything else. Not to mention just the supply chain issues that people can't get the things that they want exactly when they want them. I certainly get frustrated about that. Looks like the above ground pool is going to now need a part that I'm not sure exists. So this is a fun time. I'm trying to um about it. Okay, well, the survivors of the mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas, and Buffalo gave emotional testimonies before Congress yesterday. They took place hours before a planned House vote on gun control measures, including legislation to prohibit the sale of semi-automatic rifles to those under 21. 
Democrats hoped these survivor stories would increase pressure on Republicans against gun control. But Republican op- opposition makes it all but certain that the measures will fail in the Senate, even though they will get out of the House. During the testimonies, by the way, Republicans in the room appeared completely unmoved and reiterated their earlier positions on guns. This is the New York Times now. Evil, they said, uh, let's see, uh, Congressman Andrew Clyde said, evil deeds do not transcend constitutional rights. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Evil deeds do not transcend constitutional rights. This guy is a real piece of work, this Andrew Clyde. Uh, Senator John Cornyn, whose vote matters dramatically in the U.S. Senate, he's from Texas, of course, he insisted in an interview that any change, quote, has to be incremental. So the door's open, but just very little. Uh, Congressman Louis Gomer, who is a witch, as far as I can tell, uh, suggests that uh, mass shootings happen because prayer has been eliminated from school. So only gets crazier. Marjorie Taylor Greene suggested that the Jewish space lasers are targeting kids. Then she spoke in tongues and fired off a revolver in the House chamber. And the fact that you believe most, if not all of that, is what the problem is. None of those things happen. In a related news story, the Uvalde shooting has pushed U.S. teachers who already are stressed by the pandemic to their limits, according to the New York Times research and interviews. Residents are seeking to understand how school shootings could have been plotted there twice in four years. A couple of other stories. uh, More than 90 women said that they were sexually assaulted by Dr. Larry Nasser, the former doctor for U.S. gymnastics. They filed lawsuits against the FBI for failing to investigate him. It's a huge scandal. And I think they're suing, I read, for one billion with a B dollars. Unbelievable what happened to them. The monkeypox virus, news on that, apparently it can be airborne. So that's great. Similar to the uh, coronavirus, experts said in interviews that while airborne transmission is only a small factor in the overall spread of monkeypox, There are no firm estimates regarding how much it actually contributes. And in briefings with the press and general public health officials have not explicitly addressed the possibility of airborne transmission or the use of masks for protection. But still not a bad idea, obviously, in certain places. And in other health news, by the way, Moderna released preliminary trial results indicating that a new version of its coronavirus vaccine was especially effective against the Omicron variant, which is exactly what Dr. Carroll, Dr. Aaron Carroll talked about on this show last week. The CDC estimates that two Omicron subvariants are gaining ground in the U.S. Maybe it wasn't Dr. Aaron Carroll that said that. Maybe it was Dr. Alex Ciotta, one of my buddies who's a virologist and uh, works at the state of New York studying mosquitoes and knows everything about vaccines. Yeah, it was Alex who told me that, that that was needed this weekend. Credit to him, not Aaron Carroll. My bad. I, I'm so sorry. I gave credit to Aaron Carroll, the wrong doctor. Okay, well, that's all the news I've got for you here at the top. I hope your hump day was great. I hope your Thursday is better. I hope to see you tonight. But right now, I'm going to get to my first guest. How about it? He is the great Rick Smith. Love talking to this guy. Love going on the Rick Smith show. You can hear it uh, every day, by the way, on a whole bunch of different platforms, including some local re- uh, media outlets in Pennsylvania where Rick's uh, where Rick lives. But find out how to get it everywhere at the RickSmithShow.com. And I'll read a little from his website. From the working class neighborhoods of Cleveland, where folks didn't have much and still don't, Rick went from delivering papers as a boy to a career driving 18-wheelers as a proud union member. Today, in a world of right-wing radio evangelists with fancy suits and empty souls, Rick has carved out a place for us, a place where real people can come together and hit back against the forces trying to turn the American dream into a punchline. The Rick Smith Show is for working people, uh, by working people, for working people, a place that serves up a heaping portion of democracy with a side of fairness, the grit of a teamster, and no apologies. Where facts are the center, where science is real, where everyone gets a seat at the table. Rick Smith, where working people come to talk. Check out the RickSmithShow.com and follow Rick at Rick Smith Show on Twitter. And I'll start with little, this is a few seconds of behind the scenes here at the top. This is Take a look at how it always starts. Just let me just test your audio. Count to five. One, two, three, okay. four, five. Six. It's working. All right, here we go. And boom, there he is, Rick Smith, the Rick Smith Show, the consummate, there for you, everyday guy, and love to talk to him, love to go on his show. Always, always great to have him joining me to talk about, well, we could talk about anything, but I always love talking about the state of labor, of course, the labor movement. Good to see you. How are you? I am fantastic. How are you, Pete? Good. I see that you're uh, you're wearing a, a Broncos, a Denver Broncos football team hat, and you just told me that a 
apparently the the football team has been sold or, or bought by somebody in the in the Walton family, the Walmart family, the richest family in the world, or something like that. Yeah, it's sad. I, you know, it's sad. You know, the, I know a lot of people are going to be thrilled in Denver because it's going to bring a lot of money and a lot of resource, and uh, you know, maybe a new stadium on the horizon. You know, even though I, I love the old one, I loved the old one, old one. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm heartbroken in a kind of a way because I haven't been in an actual Walmart in over 25 years. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, kind of a push pull for me here. According to Denver's and local news, the sale price of the Denver Broncos came in at a whopping $4.65 billion, a record sale that was previously held by the Carolina Panthers. Well, I mean, listen, the Walton Penner group outbid three other bidding groups, apparently, but, uh, Rob Walton, the eldest son of Walmart, Walmart founder Sam Walton, and the heir to the Walton fortune. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna like pro football, uh, if you're gonna buy an automobile, you're likely to not like how the CEO yeah. made their money or behave. Whether it's Elon Musk or, or the Walton, I mean, what only a billionaire can afford a pro sports team, and there are no good billionaires. Now, this is true, and this is. This is kind of the problem that, that that I face in this moment. You know, I'm I'm with you. You know, there there are no good. There they're, they're all bad. So I mean, you just have to. I think I, I don't know. I like I don't know. I stopped kind of caring as much about professional sports, but I still watch a little bit. But like, I think pilot that was part of it. I mean, does it does it really? Is it? It's always there now. But knowing that this this owner of of your team, I guess. Yeah, no, I looked it, 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 it could have been a lot of different people. It could have been yeah. a lot of different billionaires. It was just like, it was, it was one of the worst ones. You know, there's, I, I've been one of these people for a long time that I have a, a list of, of least favorite billionaires, you know, cause you've got your favorites. Uh, you've got your least favorites. You got your loans. You like to beat up on the ones you like to go. Uh, it's like a game almost. We created them. Yeah. Uh, we've you know had lower wages, less health care, less educational opportunities. We've allowed our infrastructure to crumble. Uh, we've destroyed a middle class for it. You know, we look, we've we've built these people off our back, our sweat, our labor, you know, our sacrifice. We've created these billionaires. Uh, you know, we should live vicariously through some of them, maybe a little bit. Or am I off base? I mean, I guess if I guess I'm trying to think of how you would what you would want to have uh, that billionaires have in their life. And I suppose that see, see, the idea of financial security is is one that eludes most of us most of our lives. But you don't have to be a billionaire for finance. So I'm all I'm saying is you could be well off and have financial security and never worry about it. You don't have to be a billionaire. And so I guess the only thing a billionaire has that that a millionaire doesn't is space travel. So if you want that, <laughs> then I guess you're missing out. Would you go with, if someone said to you tomorrow, Rick, would you like to go up in this rocket? And, and would you go? Yeah, I would go. You would. Sure. I, I would look, I would, I would, I would love I don't want to go in a rocket. I'm good. Yeah. I, there's a look, I, I, I've done a lot of things that, you know, that, that are risky that, you know, you go, Hey, I, 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 I like experiences, you know, just took my kid whitewater rafting the first time he got to go. I love that stuff. I you know, love climbing over stuff. Even as I'm old, I love climbing over stuff. I love falling down stuff. Um, I just, you know, like doing it. Okay. So uh, you go up in a rocket. Fair enough. I guess uh, somebody actually likes billionaires more than they're admitting to. Uh, no, 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 no. I see that you didn't, you said, would you go up in a rocket? Yeah, I would love to. I would love nope. to do it. Uh, we've got now, your, would I we've love got to do your it answer. As opposed to feeding children and making sure that we have opportunity, all of the other opportunity costs. Of course not. Billionaire apologist, Rick Smith, everybody. <laughs> uh, I cornered no, you. Look, I, th- I, 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 I always say we need to, who, who are going to be the next? Who's going to be the next Teddy Roosevelt? We need a trust buster. Who's going to be the next mm. Harry Truman uh, with the uh, the war profiteers and, and the commissions to dig into that stuff? Who's going to be the next good socialist president like Dwight David Eisenhower with a top mar- marginal tax rate of ninety two percent to go after these billionaires and, and tax the shit out of them? Yeah, you know, that's what we need to be doing because we do have massive problems in this country that. You know, taxing the shit out of billionaires would help. I don't know. Maybe helping all a generation who got screwed on their student loans and told, hey, the only chance you've got at, at a middle class is take out these massive predatory student loans that you're never going to pay back. I got a young relative 
who, you know, just over the, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a family get together. She told me she's a hundred grand in debt to get a job as a vet tech. Mm. Uh, she wanted to go and become a, a veterinarian. She just goes, the, the, the money's just way too much. So she's got a, a four year degree plus uh, to become like a, almost a veterinarian. Almost. She's, eh. But she's going to make about 25, 26 bucks an hour. She's got a hundred grand in student loan debt. She's never paying that off. The interest rates are nine, 10, 11 percent. She's never paying this stuff off. And she has no idea how she's going to how she's going to make you, ends meet. Somebody Living was somebody I like and trust, uh, who I think is smart, was was just talking about the campaign or rather the she's the uh, uh, college loan forgiveness issue, saying that it's just bad messaging for Democrats and that it really splits uh, a lot of people. I mean, it sounds like you are supportive of it i certainly nope. am supportive of it I, I i don't think people should be in debt to their education and i think a government should invest in educating its people and i think in europe and asia where they do that it it, it is the greatest investment that a government that a people can make so the idea that they're having to pay back loans and 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 the things that don't get measured like all the stress and all the all the opportunities they don't take as a result is is bullshit but what do you think about the idea that it's the conversation around it as anything is not nuanced enough and Democrats get hit over the head with this idea that they're okay with, you know, irresponsible loans. It's, it's a loser for Democrats, no matter what they do, because they're going to get into intergenerational warfare. They're going to get into generational warfare because I didn't go to college because I wasn't going to be irresponsible. You're going to get into all that. So Democrats are, this is a loser, I think on a number of levels. I know a lot of people are going to be really happy. A lot of people are going to be really unhappy. I've said from the beginning, you've got to seek for fairness. And fairness is the predatory part of this. The fact that she's being saddled with 9 and 10 and 11 percent interest and can't get out from under these with really horrible terms. uh, That's a huge part of this. I said from the beginning, the federal government should buy them all up. And and much like we did with the homeownership loan corporation back during the New Deal, uh, you'll pay them back at a very low in- interest rate, zero, 0.2 percent, whatever the administration cost is, and, and you'll pay back what you borrowed. Uh, but in the longer term, we fix what we've done to education. And for me, that's the bigger part of this and say we're not going to fuck a generation like we did this last one again. We're going to do what what past generations have done for education what the baby boomers got. Uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks, you get to go to college. As long as you can get in, as long as you can keep up, you can do the work. You go as far as your talents and your work ethic will take you. That's what we should be promoting. And those are the policies we should be moving towards. We can't just have a moment in history where we slice out and go, OK, debt forgiveness, move forward and continue to screw the next generation. There's got to be a place where we go. Sorry, all this privatization, all this profitization, all of this education incorporated bullshit. We've got to figure out how to fix this stuff, reclaim our education. We've got to move forward in a way that, like I said, uh, as far as your your talents, as far as your work ethic, as far as your ability will take you, not as deep as your pocketbooks. That's what we should be moving forward on because we need an educated workforce. We need people who are who are smart, who are talented, who are able. We need those in the future, and we're just sorry, uh, we're not we're not that society yet. Really well said. Really well said. Uh, let me move on to another issue, which actually you made me aware of before I hit record, which is this story. The the Guardian uh, is covering it, but it is a study. It's a study. The Institute for Policy Studies. I love them. IPS uh, found that a study of three hundred top U.S. companies that the average gap between CEO and medium worker pay jumped to 200, uh, rather 670 to one, meaning the average CEO received $670 in compensation for every dollar the worker received. The ratio was up from 604 to 601. Now 670 in just uh, two years, 49 firms had ratios above a thousand to one more than a third of the companies surveyed found the median worker did not keep pace with inflation. And this check Amazon. (laughs) What do you mean? Sorry. Check Amazon. Get the get the get the Andy Jazzy's uh, pay ratio. Oh, oh, yeah. Check out what they are specifically. Yeah. Six thousand 
four hundred and seventy four to one. Uh. Uh, because they they said, no, no, you can have two hundred and twelve million dollar pay package because you're worth sixty five hundred people because you get in there and you pack those boxes like sixty five hundred people. You drive those trucks like sixty five hundred people. You deliver those packages. You you get online and you do all that compute like sixty five hundred people. And this is what blows my mind is that someone actually on those boards think that that one guy is somehow worth an entire warehouse full of people. I mean, you know, if you look at JFK 8, the 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 warehouse in Staten Island that organized recently with the Amazon Labor Union. Uh there are about 6500 people there, maybe a little bit more. Uh this Andy Jazzy, this the CEO makes as much as the entire facility. Is as much as every worker in that place, what guy makes as much as all of those people? And somehow they justify his salary and not giving those people better wages, hours, conditions, a voice on the job. Somehow they, they justify this. I mean, and, and, I, and this is where my struggle is. This is where there's always been this war between organized capital and organized labor, which is why I'm a labor guy. I'm not a billionaire, and if I were, I'd be like possibly like Musk, going billionaires make people happy. We're wonderful, which is why you're seeing this kind of this kind of PR campaign. Because you know today's billionaires, they're yesterday's robber barons. Sorry, that's the reality. Uh, and I've said you know for a long time that behind every billionaire is a great crime. Yeah, uh, the great crime of Amazon was they got to screw states and the federal government out of taxes. For decades, they got away with it. And the, the great crime is they're screwing their workers. I this would... is where in this moment, we're, we're finally for a brief moment seeing, you know, workers saying we've had enough. And then we're seeing organizing in places that we haven't seen, you know, places like Starbucks, places like Apple. We're seeing people finally saying enough of this bullshit. Uh, we want better wages, hours, conditions. Yes, but we want dignity. We want respect. We want to change a culture uh, that we're we're no longer we're no longer putting up with, and the billionaires they're spending a little resource, little uh, on trying to, to hold on to what they've got. It'll be interesting to see once this recession happens that they're causing because again this inflation, not because Joe Biden gave fourteen hundred bucks to everybody, not because workers are demanding a small raise and 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 better health care. Nope, it's because these these. Fuckers who sit in these corporate boardrooms are demanding higher profits, and it's it's showing in their their earnings calls. It's showing in their profit margin. Yeah, it would seem. Well, first of all, just a couple things I wanted to get your take on. But first, if you know, you mentioned Andy Jazzy, he's uh, CEO of Amazon, six thousand four hundred and seventy five times the company's pay. He shareholders approved a two hundred and twelve million dollar pay deal for him. I don't know if that's for one year or what, but. I, I I would just think that if the average employee has any complaints about their salary, their benefits, their work situation, their time off, all the things that workers are entitled to, if they have any real issue or if that issue is overall they're unhappy about things, then nobody should be making that much money. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a quality of life thing. And obviously, we've heard of nightmares for Amazon employees. But the other thing uh, I think is, what, you know, what do you do about it? What can you do about it? And finally, do you think, and most importantly, Rick, how much of this had to do with, as you said, workers getting fed up and how much of it had to do with the leverage that workers got as a result of the pandemic, to some extent, what that laid bare? And isn't the increases that they're getting and and the advantages that some workers are getting kind of uh, pushed out by the fact that things cost more? Well, the inflation's the inflation is hurting everybody, and that's that's reality. Um, and this is where you know I go back to the cultures. You know, my grandparents built a culture that that built what we call a middle class. I don't use the middle class frame at all. I I always talk in terms of working class, whether you work for a living or you don't. Um, now, middle class to me is some kind of a you know high minded you know thought process that I'm not in the middle class. I'm a, I do well in the working class. I want a prosperous working class. I want people to do well. 
Uh, my grandparents' generation, they built a prosperous working class, the most prosperous working class in history. And as I remember, you know, my grandparents, when they lived through the era of stagflation during the 70s, uh, their wages didn't get eroded away because their union contracts had cost of living adjustments in their contracts. And if you have a strong, vibrant labor movement, and we don't right now, this idea that you know big labor is out there you know, killing these, these poor little companies is ridiculous. We've got a, a private sector unionized workforce of about 6%. <laughs> and now you go back to my grandparents' generation, it was 35%. So there is a huge world of difference. Uh, so you had the power back then to demand these things in contracts. You had the power to demand better wages, hours, conditions, respect, dignity, all the things that my grandparents' generation did then instill in me the beliefs possible that we can have. And I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking at this generation going, they've had enough. They've watched their parents get screwed over. They've watched a generation suffer and struggle and, and sacrifice. And yeah, here's an opportunity and they're taking advantage of it. That said, uh, inflation's harming them and we're going to have to deal with that. But the idea that this had anything to do with Biden's spending on giving people fourteen hundred bucks or uh, the meager wages that are, are being put out there is just yeah. just ludicrous. Uh, and it's happening all over the world. So that's yeah, the, mean, the easiest you know, the easiest policy complaint. You know, whether you're talking about gas prices or or anything else, it's like this is not happening in isolation. You can look at tax policies and other economic policies that clearly are affecting one country more than another, but everybody's paying more for gas right now. Everybody's paying more for everything right now. And inflation more than anything else is as a result of COVID and, and supply chain issues and, yeah. and, and they're not being enough people to work and, and fill up the, the cargo uh, holds and, and containers. And then they're not being enough containers. Like there's not much you can, not a lot you can do about that when there's a disease spreading and it's going to take a, a time. But what you're saying also is, a lot of companies are raising their prices artificially and gouging, and that is, of course, uh, immoral and reprehensible. That's what it sounds well, like. Well, take, take the oil industry. I mean, you, you know, we had a, a great a guest on not too long ago from the Democracy Collaborative, uh, and they actually sit and listen to all of the uh, the earnings calls and you know what the CEOs are telling their shareholders. Uh, the oil the oil companies were saying, "Look, you know, we've got the capacity to increase production. We choose not to." Uh, we've got there are there are thousands of leases that are out there. Biden has given out more leases than anybody in the last in my lifetime. Uh, they're saying, please go drill. And the oil companies are going, no, we're not going to do it. Why should we? We like things right where they are. We're producing you know, what where we want because we're making massive amounts of profit. We're, we're raking in the cash. We're do we don't have to do much work. Uh, we're, we don't have to increase productivity. We don't have to increase production. And we're making huge amounts of cash. They don't care about the country as a whole. They don't care about your suffering. They don't care about your pain. They don't care about you getting to, to anywhere. They don't care about you. They care about their bottom line. That's capitalism. Welcome to it. Uh, you can put that into baby formula. You can put that into ice cream. You can put that into anything you want. Corporate America is not about making you comfortable. It's not about making your life better. It's about making profit. And the sooner we wake up to that reality, maybe the sooner we'll go, OK, it's not Joe Biden doing this because there's no magic switch. There's nothing in the Oval Office that says raise gas prices, lower gas prices. There are no switches under the desk of the Oval Office. So uh, maybe policies that would maybe bring some of these CEOs in and you know slap them around a little bit, both literally and figuratively. I had a, I had a caller said, maybe we bring maybe we bring an oil CEO in and, you know, bring Will Smith in. You know, something, something uh, to chop <laughs> the system, something to get something. Well, moving. I mean, I think all you need is Katie Porter. I mean, there are or Elizabeth <laughs> Warren or Bernie Sanders. I mean, there, there are some great Democrats who are uh, very effective, both the House and Senate on specific committees grilling the CEOs. And I just don't know that they have any shame. I mean, I, I, don't, don't. I don't know that. They, they, there need to be new laws put in place, obviously, new, new, new policies. So, no, and here's where we're, we're in this weird spot because, you know, every, the, the narrative is, you know, blame Biden. And we do this to every president. It's just not Biden. We did it to, to Bush back after 9 11. We've done it to other people for, you know, other presidents. And it's, it's always these, these CEOs. And I, I go back to, uh, what was it, August 18th, uh, 2019. Do you remember, you know, do you remember that date in history? 
it was the date of the grand epiphany. It was the date the business roundtable had their their great epiphany. Uh, they 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 realized that they weren't the the most important thing anymore. They were gonna they they promised us that uh, shareholder value was, yes. was no longer all it was all about. They they cared about customers. They were gonna care about communities. They were gonna care about workers. Oh my gosh, they had the despicable be light bulb. They had their light bulb moment. There it was. And then the pandemic hit, and then they showed us that their their epiphany was all bullshit because they had a chance to care about workers and consumers and about about communities. And they said, oh, "Fuck you, we care about right. profit." Right now, I do remember that now. Uh, and, and and where are we right now? Their profit margins haven't been better. Uh, they're taking care of their. In fact, they're making their money back. They're taking care of themselves, and they're telling us, "Hey, you know, go pound sand." Uh, the baby formula stuff. They knew they were going to have problems. Other companies could have ramped up production in the interim. We could have, we could have been doing a lot of stuff. Our problems are we've allowed corporate America so much power. We've allowed them to consolidate. We've allowed them to drive. We've given them massive, enormous tax breaks. And what are they doing with those tax breaks, Pete? They're buying their shares back. They're admitting to us. We've got no productive use for the money that you're giving us. We've got no productive use other than buying our shares back. That's admitting that we can't buy any more new equipment. We can't hire any workers. We have no productive use for the tax money you're giving us other than to buy back shares and make ourselves wealthier. So wouldn't that make policymakers go, hmm, we could put that money to better use, feeding children, educating them, getting health care for seniors, doing, I don't know, burning it in a giant fucking pit to warm people up. I don't know <laughs> something more productive than making wealthy people uh, wealthy. Another thing, by the way, Rick Smith, and, and let, we can get off economic. You talk about all kinds of issues on the Rick Smith show uh, weeknights from eight to 10. Uh, Central time, nine to nine to 11 PM Eastern. Oh, my bad. And available everywhere. Uh, so what about guns? That's another thing that is uniquely American. It seems like the best argument. It doesn't happen anywhere else. It's not about mental health. It's not about video games. It's not about family values, a lack of religion. I mean, anything can contribute. It's a yep. nuanced issue, but the problem, uh, all those issues are certainly at play and everywhere from Japan to Israel to, you know, uh, Scandinavia, and they don't have these issues. And when they do, that shooter in Norway or New Zealand or uh, Canada with their new restrictions as a result of our gun violence, they do something about it. Do you think that what we are hearing from the U.S. Senate this time around is that something at the at the congressional level than the U.S. congressional level might be done? Because I always like to give credit to the activists and organizations in places like Connecticut and my state of New York, where our governor just signed a, a bunch of reforms. So changes do happen at the state level in blue states often as a result of horrible gun violence. But do you think there's going to be any change here on, on guns as a result of these most recent horror, horrible shootings? My gut tells me no. Uh, again, I've seen these movies over and over again. When Joe Manchin says, hey, I can support something, I think of Lucy with the football. Um, he said that before. Uh, I, when I, I hear Mitch McConnell say, you know, we're going to, I can support something, I, I, I'm rightfully jaded. I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I am. I hope something can happen. But if nothing happens in the next two weeks, no, I don't see I don't see it happening. Um, and if something does, I, I don't I don't think it's going to be the kind of reform that we we're going right. to we're going to see as overly helpful. Uh, I, I think they will tighten some some maybe some background check stuff that that's going to be out there. But I don't know that it's going to be all that much more than we have in, in many states. I, I I'm hopeful. Let's let's go there now. As 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 far as guns, uh, I'm somebody who, uh, as a kid growing up in the housing projects in the west side of Cleveland, when I saw somebody with a gun run because somebody's going to die, uh, I've seen people shot. I've seen people shot and killed. Um, I've watched the life bubble out of people's chest. Jesus. Not not something good to see. I now live in a neighborhood uh, in a rural community. Uh, where if you see somebody with a gun, uh, they're probably going to the free gun range down the road. You hear shots all the time. I've got a shotgun, uh, you know, within arm's reach of me here in my studio. Uh, I am a gun owner as well. So I am not a gun grabber. 
I do think there are some common sense things that, that we should be doing. Sorry, the AR-15s and the, the high power things that, that are fun to shoot. I have shot them. They are fun. Um, I, I don't think they should be in the hands of average everyday c- citizens. And I think they should be much harder to get than they are. Uh, that said, the high capacity magazine is something we should be dealing with uh, as well. Are we going to? No, uh, we're not going to. There's too much money involved in it. And that's the problem. And, and you know, look, you know, I, I get this all the time, you know, but you're you're not going to stop all bad things from happening. You liberals want to make. No, I know you're not going to stop bad things from happening. But the shotgun I got over here, it's, it's, it's a three shell shotgun. There, you got three shots. So if you can make it past three shots, you got a shot at me. You got a chance to come stop me. If I got a hundred capacity magazine in it, it's a lot harder for you to, to survive that that initial onslaught. So for me, it's about the severity of the when the bad things happen. Uh, sure, we'll give you a musket. You want to go shoot up a school with a musket? Go ahead, give it a shot. You want to go in there with a butter knife? Go ahead, give it a shot. There's at least a fighting chance. Now, there are some on the right, and I made. You know, not not really a joke. I, I was more out of frustration. I said, if we're not going to do anything on guns, we should arm our children with, you know, with body armor. Send them to school with, you know, flak jackets and and backpacks and, and that, are, that are bulletproof and all this stuff. I was being facetious. Yesterday, I see that Newsmax, that crap, that piece of crap station, uh, they came out. Who, by the way, the McConaughey thing was was I, I was moved. I was touched. I was, you know, I was almost, you know, brought to tears. But that asshole reporter from Newsmax at the end going, "Are you just grandstanding, sir?" I wish someone would have smacked the shit yeah. out of him. Yeah, but that's a whole other, a whole other thing. Y- um, I mean, it's it, it's it's a kind of a, it's a fair question in in a way to ask why a celebrity, a very well known celebrity, becomes uh, an activist. But I, I'm fine with debating that. But if you're a smart yeah. per- if you're a smart person and if you're a thoughtful person and you know cameras are going to follow you everywhere. I mean, I think George Clooney's always been really good at this. If you're going to follow me everywhere, I'm going to Darfur. Uh and I'll and, and you know, I think McConaughey is entitled to that too. I don't I'm not a big Matthew McConaughey fan in terms of his, you know, some of the things he's done and said. He sounds like kind of a douche, but he was on point and that was. yesterday was I I I think incontrovertible in terms of it being you know, his wife sitting there with a pair of shoes, that stuff matters and makes a huge, huge difference. So you can call whatever you want. It was effective and it mattered. And I hope something, I hope some, you know, something moves as a result. Yeah. yeah I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a huge fan, but I thought what he did and I thought his speech was, was, was spot on. Well, and, uh, and especially AP, being and AP, from that, that, that area. I mean, uh, I yeah. thought that, you know, that was, that was why he was there. Right. Uh, but to that, I don't know. You took it differently than I did. I had to turn and smack the shit out of the guy. Uh, but that's just me. Yeah, I don't I, I don't smack the shit out of anybody because I I've, that is always ends poorly for me. The Associated Press, Zeke Miller, asked why Biden tapped McConaughey didn't and didn't speak for himself. Does he feel like his voice doesn't matter? And I, that that irked me as well, because that's not a Newsmax reporter. That's an AP reporter. Joe Biden has made hundreds of speeches about yeah. gun violence, especially during the Obama administration when he was vice president. He has always been very vocal about gun violence and wanting to do something about it. So I just I don't like that question either. He, like he doesn't speak for himself. He, he just went back. He just went to Uvalde. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, I, I'm with you there. Now, let me ask you the other side of this question, because, you know, I thought the the way that McConaughey went through and, and talked about each of the children and their their hopes and their dreams and their and and really focused on the girl with the green, the green converse and how, you know, that's how they they identified her. Uh, the, the you know, the, the conversation about showing the pictures uh, has begun again. And I'm I'm dead set against the the idea of, uh, you know, as a parent, I, I would be against it. I'm curious, you know, do you think it would be helpful in a situation to show the the, the mutilated bodies from these? No, from I these, don't. These I, bullets? If I believed that it would change something. I just don't. I believe it will do more harm than good. I believe it will. Right, it right. will damage anybody who sees those photos for the rest. See, of I, I go the other way with it. I go that I think we're such a misery porn society that it might encourage people to want to do more. And that kind of carnage and that kind of visual 
would bring some sick people out to try I and never, hey, I can top that. I, <laughs> I never thought about that, but it's not, it's not unrealistic because of, yeah, you're right about that. I think, um, let me ask you about another subject, Rick Smith, uh, your thoughts on, let's see, this is going to air tomorrow. So your thoughts on tonight's hearings, uh, you'll be broadcasting. I'm going to be doing a host in a live chat for subscribers. Just watch a watch party. If you will, you'll be watching. I'm sure though. I mean, what, what, what are your yeah, thoughts? We're just, what we're going to do is we're taking the night off. We're going to air it live it. In, in our place. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, because, you know, I think it's that important. Sure. Do I think it's going to move the needle at all? No, I think I think we've I think Democrats waited so long because they wanted to be so thorough uh, that I think people are already in their camps. Is this going to move people? I hope so. I hope I hope the the what they bring out is compelling. I hope what they bring out is um, is, is going to move the needle. I don't think so. I think the narrative has been spun. I think the right wing Outrage Machine has done a really great job of, of spinning their their flock into a frenzy of it's, you know, all a hoax. And it was just another day, you know, in the park. And it was Antifa because, uh, you know, all those black people were able to change their skin color to look like old white people like me somehow, which is amazing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm not hopeful. Yeah. Uh, and. We'll see. Do you now, think Democrats- the other part, I've got some some points of intrigue. Uh, I really want to. Ho- I hope they dig into what uh, what happened to Pence. Uh, I want to know why uh, you know Pence was basically barricaded in that that uh, that that parking garage, and why his his identification card didn't get him through the door, and why they kept pushing him in the car, and why he didn't get it want to get into the car, why yeah. he fought so hard. Yeah, yeah. I and have why Grassley, about that too. you know, yeah. didn't expect him to be there, and you know how this. I hope they put all of those pieces together because you know the reality is is you know Pence really. As much as I despise him, as much as I, I think he's not a good person, not a great guy, in this moment, whether he meant to or not, he did raise rise to the occasion, uh, I think, to, to save our democracy. I, I think, yeah, the, the bar is pretty low, but yes. The no, bar I mean, was- just by not getting in the car, because I think he gets in that car, and this is, again, just my my weird conspiracy, conspiracy yeah. theory. I think he gets into that car. He's somewhere in Fairbanks, Alaska, under under a rock until <laughs> until the, I'm no, not sure. keep him safe. You know, there's a there's a riot going on because look, I think yeah. all that was staged. I think it was all planned. It was a military operation. They they entered in all places at once. They went only so far. It just seems so contrived. It when you now put other pieces in place, uh, a lot of it for me fits, and uh, we'll see how the uh, how Jamie Raskin and Benny Thompson and Liz Cheney put this put this out in public, uh, especially when you put the memo, the Eastman memo together and you put a lot yeah. of the other pieces together. Um, now, for me, the bigger part of this is out of this, we could end up in my state of Pennsylvania with a Nazi as governor who was at that uh, at that January 6th uh, riot. You know, we'll yeah, see. what's his name again? That's the guy running in Pennsylvania. Uh, Benito Mastriano. I mean, Doug Mastriano. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. Yeah, yeah, Doug Mastriano. I, I call him Benito Mastriano because, like, look, you know, he, he looks like a thumb, uh, just like Benito uh, Mussolini. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we could have a Nazi as governor. Uh, all right. Well, we will uh, not speculate too much more on a thing that's happening tonight, but I, I appreciate your insight on that and uh, and everything else, man. I love talking. To you. It's been way too long. The whole time I'm talking, I'm like, why don't I talk to Rick Smith more? This is great. I love. Uh, I always love chatting with you. Anything else? Anything you got to plug on the way out? Anything else you uh, you wanted to rant on? Oh, I got a lot to rant on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I got a lot to rant on. My I, labor friends, uh, you know the, uh, the the big conventions coming up. The AFL CIO conventions coming up in Philadelphia. We will be there. Uh, we'll also be at the AFT convention in uh, in July in Boston. Oh, uh, looking forward to our very friends. cool. Well, uh, well, uh, I'll take dispatches from you from both those. I can I'll book you right now for that. I'd love to hear what uh, what is going on there. But for more, obviously, listen to Rick, the Rick Smith show dot com to find out everything. Dude, always a pleasure. I love talking to you and I always appreciate when you have me on your show. So thank you so much for joining me today. Beautiful stuff, Pete. Thanks, brother. All right. There he goes. Rick Smith. Hopefully you like that update on the labor movement, his thoughts on things 
Love talking to that guy, listening to that guy at Rick Smith Show on Twitter. Check out the Rick Smith Show.com to find out how to listen to Rick. And now it's time to get to David Daly, who is an expert on politics, specifically when it comes to gerrymandering, redistricting. I check in with him about once a month these days on the show. And I always love our conversations. That's coming up in one minute. But first, I do have to tell you about Indeed.com because if you haven't heard about them, you should. They're the hiring platform. Hire new talent for your company, your firm, where you can attract, interview, and hire and all in one place. So if you want people who are great at problem-solving skills and think like an entrepreneur, the thing you need help with, how to find them. Well, that's easy. You need Indeed.com, folks. When you sponsor an Indeed post in the U.S., you're likely you're three times more likely to get a hire, according to Indeed data. The right candidate is doing everything they can to find you. And if you use Indeed, you can be sure you're doing everything you can to find them, too. Because finding great talent doesn't have to be a second job. You can hire faster and better with Indeed. Sign up for Indeed now. Get a $75 credit towards your first sponsored job. Plus, earn up to $500 in sponsored job credits with Indeed's virtual interviews. Visit Indeed.com slash stand up to learn more. Indeed is going to save you headaches. You interview virtually with no downloads or plugins or purchases because that's really annoying. You do it all in one place with Indeed. With Indeed's reliability assessment, they can even predict candidates' punctuality and work attendance and favorite color and smell. Okay, maybe not those last two, but that would be pretty cool. Even better, Indeed is the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire talent fast, and plenty of listeners that have as well. Claim your credits at Indeed.com slash standup. Indeed.com slash standup. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right. With that said and done, I also need you to sign up for a paid subscription. Stand up at Pete.com if you haven't already. All right. Joining me now is a senior fellow for Fair Vote and the author of Rat Fuck, the true story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy, which helped spark the recent drive to reform gerrymandering. David's second book is Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy. You should buy them both. It chronicles the victories and defeats and state efforts to reform elections and uphold voting rights. David Daly is a frequent lecturer, media source about gerrymandering, former editor-in-chief of Salon.com, and former CEO and publisher of the Connecticut News Project. His work appears in The New Yorker, Washington Post, The Guardian, New York Magazine, The Atlantic, Boston Globe, Rolling Stone, Salon.com, The Hill, CNN, NPR, you name it. I named a whole bunch of them, and I'm very, very happy to have him join me again. You can follow him on Twitter at DaveDaily3. Here is our latest right now. Okay, I'm recording. I've got him now in an undisclosed hotel that rhymes with Bilton. <laughs> David Daly, good to see you, my friend. Pleasure to be here, Pete. Thanks for having me back. Why do you why do you have a weird obsession with the man who shot Ronald Reagan? Why don't you just be transparent about your feelings about this man? Uh, you know, um, have you heard his music? Because I think his music is actually quite good. Um, I think he he could be our next country music sensation. Does he do country? Um, he he writes these like sad country songs. And I suppose you might say, well, if he'd simply written a sad country song about a boy who loved a Jodie Foster and not showed up outside the Washington Hilton, uh, I guess I will name the undisclosed location where I am. That might have been a better idea, but that's not what he did. He waited until he was in his 60s to write the sad country song. Oh. And, you know, I feel like I saw that assassination almost live on TV, right? Remember the days of, yeah. like, Frank Reynolds had to, like, break into whatever was going on. It was a half day from school. I remember being home that day and, like, watching it. Um, well, and they pronounced Reagan dead at one point. Did? And, like, Frank Reynolds comes back on and he's angry and he bangs on the desk and he says we've got to get it right it was like a moment out of network or something unfolding he said that on the, he, first of all frank reynolds was the anchor and he said that on the air at the desk well he was a little bit mad that they called the president dead well when yeah he wasn't so he was like uh, come on guys can we at least get that right wow he must have been a real nice guy around the office i mean he he's right he's right to have that feeling, of course, I've been that way. But when I was on live air, too, I suppose. But it's it's better to keep your 
you're cool, I guess. But but it is, it is. did you ever think? Do you ever? I mean, we're I'm going to talk about gun violence with you. Your your recent piece at Salon dot com, uh, really important about how these decisions about guns or any other major important issue get decided by minorities. But I mean, imagine if. You know, John Hinckley was disturbed, to say the least, mentally ill. Uh, everybody knows why he did what he did to impress an, an actress and everything. It's just, you know, we see those types of people committing violence all the time in America now. Maybe the difference between Hinckley and what was it, 81 and 2022 is the access to guns and, and, and the kind of guns and the that are uh, available. And, 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 to, and right? Yeah, I mean, had, had Hinckley had an AR-15, a lot of things would have been different, essentially. I, I think that's right. Um, I mean, he he certainly you know altered James Brady's life forever. Um, some of the Secret Service agents, uh, but you know, with an AK with a you know, AK forty seven, that's 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 a that's a bloodbath. Yeah, I mean, there would have been a lot more dead people uh, for sure, and that's exactly what we're seeing now with with so many of these these shootings and these types of guns. But the the, the point is, as you write in Salon, minority rules. Children die. Our broken political system has lethal consequences. Our democracy is hopelessly paralyzed. We see the consequences in Uvalde and Buffalo. So what do we do about it? This is, you know, in this piece, you, you lay it out for us about how voters never decided it would be, you write, bearable to see children murdered or nothing or that nothing could be done. The root problem remains the same. Our broken political institutions in which small minorities exert veto power over much larger majorities, even while third graders die. Quite a way of saying it. You have quite a way of of words and making them impactful, but this is exactly what's happening. It is. I mean, I get frustrated because every time, you know, there's a couple things that happen every time there's one of these shootings, right? You, we get trapped in that same dreary and predictable cycle. And the onion puts up their story about the only, can't believe it happened again, says the only country where it happens. And there's another viral tweet that that goes around about from a British journalist that, you know, talks about how all of this was was guaranteed the moment after Sandy Hook when America decided this was bearable. And we never decided that this was bearable. The American people have been remarkably consistent on gun violence after Sandy Hook all the way through this moment, there are huge majorities, 60, 70 percent on some of the things that could be done. They don't get done, not because we decided that it was bearable to have third graders massacred. They don't get done because we have a, a completely broken political system that puts all of the veto power in the hands of a small, extreme minority of people who have locked up control over over our institutions. Absolutely. I mean, those those huge majorities, you're right. Public opinion has been consistent for years. Majorities of Americans support banning high capacity ammunition magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. They support banning assault style weapons. They support, quote, red flag laws that would allow a judge to remove guns from someone who is at obvious risk for violent behavior. They support creating a national gun database, adding background checks for private sales and gun shows and even raising the age for gun ownership. So daily, why can't, why can't we get it done? We can't get it done because, uh, well, uh, we can't get it done because state legislatures have been gerrymandered. Uh, so that, uh, even in states where there are huge majorities on this, uh, those majorities can't act. It can't happen in Congress because the filibuster gives veto power to, uh, a tiny majority of the nation. Um, the number of senators who can block legislation that huge majorities of Americans want to see, they can be blocked by 40 Republican senators representing as, as little as 24 percent of the population. And it, in the U.S. House, you also see the effect of the gerrymander. Uh, I mean, Democrats have control of the chamber right now. But after Sandy Hook in 2012, the Democrats did not have control of the U.S. House. And that is despite the fact that they won 1.4 million more votes than Republicans in the 2012 election. We reelected Barack Obama in 2012. We expanded the Democratic majority in the U.S. Senate in 2012. And even though there were 1.4 million more votes for Democratic candidates for the House, Republicans held the chamber and it was even close, 234, 201. 
And so after Sandy Hook, you had to have this legislation begin in the Senate because Democrats controlled that and there was maybe a chance that it would pass a Democratic Senate. That's right. That's right. It died there. It died there thanks to the filibuster, 5446, the Manchin-Toomey bill. And at the time, Ron Brownstein, who was writing at the LA Times now, he's now a terrific uh, journalist at The Atlantic, he added up the number of people that those 54 yes votes represented and the 46 no votes. And it was 194 million represented by the 54 yes votes and 118 million represented by the 46 no votes. The 118 million won. So the combination of the gerrymander and the filibuster has acted as veto power over something that huge majorities of Americans want to see done. It doesn't get done and kids keep dying. How does the similar issue affect state legislatures? Because one of the things I say all the time when we talk about gun violence really bothers me, David, that people say nothing ever changes because every time this happens, Things change in state legislatures of democratically run states. Specifically, I always think about Connecticut and New York, but I'm thinking of Colorado as well. I think they did something. So we just in New York passed this major reform. I mean, who knows how much of a difference it will make? It's not nearly enough, but a bunch of different regulations in New York state. And so things do happen at the state level. Of course, they could be brought to the Supreme Court and overruled, and we can talk about that. But I think that matters. How much does gerrymandering at the state level affect that? And how much is that proof that when the majority of people in a state at least want something done about gun violence, you can actually get it done with the with, with activism, with pressure and with I think it doesn't even take courageous politicians. It's not that controversial, frankly. Right. I mean, and you see it happen in blue states. You, you see it happen uh, quickly in blue states, right? I yep. mean, the Buffalo happened just a, a couple of, of weeks ago. I know it's been kicked out of the headlines by million other shootings since then. But New York came together with a package of reforms in a matter of, a matter of weeks and passed them. Uh, so, of course, it can be done. I mean, what has to be done is not, is not that complicated, and it's all extraordinarily popular. It can't get done nationally because of the gerrymander and the filibuster. And certainly what you see in state legislatures, I think abortion and reproductive rights is probably the the best example of how this works in the states right now, because you are seeing all of these sort of, you know, personhood laws and all of these, you know, six week abortion bills pop up in states where they are not popular, even in Georgia, Alabama, Oklahoma, the states where these are passing, majorities of voters don't approve of them, even in these red states, but they can't do anything to stop it because these lawmakers are in uncompetitive districts, they are not responsive to voters, and the lawmakers simply don't care. You write about the Senate in this piece. The Senate may have been designed to be a cooling saucer that slows down political action, but it was not intended to render all action impossible. Our national crises keep mounting, keep up, keep on mounting. Our political institutions leave us no option but to bury the dead and await the next numbing catastrophe. We are broken and nearly beyond repair. We, the people, are weaponized, and a small faction of our people have weaponized our political institutions against us as well. Who writes your stuff? It's good. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that sounds good. I wish, I wish I could write like that. That's, that's okay. Really, it's really well said. I mean, it's really important the way that you, the way, yeah, you should be. We all are. And now you channel it in this, in this piece that everybody should go read. It's linked in the show notes, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's the, the part about w- awaiting the next numbing catastrophe. And, and it is, it is that it is just, it just consumes us. And no matter how hard we, we try not to let it, it, it seems to always be there. Yeah, it does. You know, I mean, um, I I started I started writing about this after Sandy Hook because I didn't understand what had happened. You know, I mean, we had a uh, I had grown up in Connecticut. We had a um, a toddler who had, who had, who was probably you know a year old at the time, um, and seeing a school shot up, I was I was not naive about guns, but I I thought, gosh. If we can't do anything right now, what are we? And when it all 
died in Congress, that was when I took a look and I said, wait a second, why did they feel like they had to start this in the Senate? Of course, it was going to end up being filibustered. Why couldn't they move this in the House? And why don't the Democrats control the House? And that was when I started looking and I, it was a bell going off. It does seem like this time is different in terms of the conversation taking place in the U.S. Senate. It mansions not an obstacle. And John Cornyn, apparently, of freaking Texas is apparently open to something. Even Republicans, apparently, in the state legislature in Texas, there seems to be movement. And for God's sakes, Matthew McConaughey is on the on the on Capitol Hill. Um, I walk. I, I was I was meeting with a, a member of Congress uh, just uh, Monday afternoon, and they said to me, "He's in with Matthew McConaughey right now. You'll be in after that." So, did you and see I, McConaughey uh, on the way out? He yeah he he walked out. He's got amazing hair. Yeah, what does he smell like? Um, Do you know what he smells like? He's got, He's got hair just uh, that yeah. a guy like me just. just yeah, I, I get it. But but what does he smell like? What you know, I, didn't, I didn't get a good whiff. What the hell's you know? wrong with you? You didn't. You uh, should have got right up. You should have got right I, up. I next. was so I Do was so taken by the hair that hair is really all I think about these days. I understand. There's a comedian who used to do a joke. I don't even look at women anymore since I started losing my hair. I just look at other guys hair. Uh, uh, so, but, but what about the, the potential for something? It will not be nearly enough, but even if there are laws that pass that reduce some gun violence, I think the idea of ending gun violence, terrorism, and poverty is a bad thing to sell the public. You don't end bad things, but you certainly can reduce them, make them better. Do you think anything might get through the U.S. Senate? I'll believe it when I see it, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Um, it means that 10 Republicans have to come on board and Cornyn makes one. Um, I guess we'll see where the other where the other nine are. Um, I, I've watched this. I've watched this dance too many times yeah. uh, to be optimistic that the song ends any other way but i i certainly hope it does uh all right well let's talk about your piece at the hill now i was talking about the piece at salon.com and you are the man on redistricting and gerrymandering nobody writes about it covers it better than you do this piece the hill.com is titled redistricting is done for 2022 and it's still terribly unfair so when you say it's done what does that mean means that just about all 50 states have completed their process and the maps are done. Um, the courts have had their say, the, the map makers have had their say, um, and the playing field for our state legislative and congressional elections is essentially set for the next 10 years. Uh, there's a difference between ugh, 10 years. Let me just let that sit in. Mm-hmm. Because the, 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 this is based on the, the U.S. Census. That's right. Yeah. Uh, explain the difference between red states and blue states, Republican-run states, Democratic-run states, because Democrats were no angels, you write, but it's still a much different or more unfair, unconstitutional, unrepresentative situation, it would seem, in the red states. I think that's right. Uh, This is not a both sides situation. Uh, Both sides might do it, but they're not doing it in the same proportion. Um, Here's, you know, both Democrats and Republicans are claiming victory after redistricting. Both of them are saying, well, we won. Um, and Democrats are saying that because the maps are a little bit better than last time. Uh, and so because it's not as bad as it was before and not as bad as it could have been, they're taking a little bit of a victory lap. Republicans, on the other hand, um, reworked Texas, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, Ohio, um, and have really sustained their advantage. Um, It used to be that Republicans would hold a majority, uh, even if Democrats won 53 or so percent of the vote, you, you had to have about a five or six point swing for the Democrats to take control of the chamber. And now that's probably down to about two points. So it's, it's certainly not as bad as what, as it was before, but it's not good. 
Um, and what has happened is that the national map has become slightly more fair by all of the individual state maps becoming kind of maximally gerrymandered. Uh, so Democrats did this in New Mexico and Nevada and Oregon and Illinois. They effectively uh, pushed it as far as they could could push things. They tried in New York and they got slapped down by the courts. Republicans did this in 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 Texas, in in Florida, in in Georgia, as I mentioned, Oklahoma, Utah, Indiana, Tennessee, Kansas, New Hampshire. The list just goes on and on and on. And the consequences for this, I think, are are twofold. R- really quick. First is that this was really a bad cycle for minority representation. Latinos, Blacks, Asian voters are driving all of the population growth in this country. The idea of redistricting is to rework a district lines in order to account for population changes. Um, and in most states, those groups lose political power, even as they gain in numbers. And then the other real danger here is the number of competitive seats in the country has really fallen off the map. We're down to a a modern low. You're looking at about less than 9% of all of the uh, U.S. House seats. If there's 435 of them, you're looking at maybe three dozen seats left that are actually going to be competitive. Gerrymandering does not affect governor races, does it? Gerrymandering does not affect governor's races except in the way that a gerrymandered legislature like in Georgia, for example, can pass voter suppression bills that make it more difficult for people to vote in gubernatorial races that can be decided by very small numbers. So what you have, though, as a result is you often have the governor winning the popular vote in the state. uh, But the state house being run by the minority party sometimes with veto proof majorities even even when the other side wins um you know more votes do you have any examples of that I, I just read one and i can't think of it but i almost want to say it was in michigan but yeah you know, i mean the examples from the last decade are pretty shocking i mean if you look at a state like like wisconsin for example 2018 in wisconsin Voters kick out Scott Walker, replace him with with Tony Evers. They reelect Tammy Baldwin to the U.S. Senate. They elect Democrats to every single statewide office, uh, Secretary of State, the Treasurer, Attorney General, all of those offices. Um, And they give Democratic candidates for the state assembly 203,000 more votes than Republican candidates. Uh, Republicans not only hold the chamber, but they hold 63 of 99 seats with 203,000 fewer votes. You can find examples of this from Pennsylvania, from Michigan, from Ohio. It goes on and on. Such a fucked up system. Yes. Uh, hence the book Rat Fucked. Um, do you, I just saw a, a CNN reporter breathlessly predicting five months out that Republicans were, if the election were held today, they would win big and take over the House. Uh, do you Do you see anything differently than that kind of thing? And is it is it way too far out to be talking about it? Yeah, I try not to make breathless predictions because anytime I do, I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, so, yes, R- Republicans are going to win the House in a runaway because I'm always wrong when I make a prediction. Good, um, good. Uh, so, you know, uh, the political winds seem to be blowing in the favor of the out party. Um, I think redistricting is going to make it harder for Democrats to hold the House. Uh, simply because they've got not much room for error in even in even in purplish states uh, where you might be able to to win a couple of seats, it's going to be really really tough. Yeah. It's 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 uphill, but I mean a lot can happen. Perhaps the January sixth hearings move some minds and show people what's at stake. Perhaps the gun violence shows people what's at stake. I don't know. I uh, appreciate that answer. This will post on Thursday. So it doesn't matter. Just quickly. I mean, we I don't love when people uh, speculate about a thing that's about to happen, but it's not just one night. What do you think of uh, uh, any thoughts at all about the hearings, the committee 
or the January 6th itself, because it just never gets old to remind people about what happened that day and how close we were. By the way, how about this one, too? What do you think of uh, of when folks on the right especially say, I love how liberals and Democrats love to ignore the, the riots of the summer of 2020 and, and, and only talk about January 6th? What do you say to that? You mean those peaceful masked riots for people demanding civil rights and... Well, human that was certainly over overwhelmingly the, the case, but there were there was you know vandalism and and some looting in some in some cities. Um, yeah, were- no, um, I think that there is a difference between exercising one's right to protest and an insurrection at the Capitol designed at blocking the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, and if Republicans want to try to draw an equivalence there, it's it doesn't it, it just doesn't hold. Yeah, I saw a video of that I hadn't seen before of the empty house that day when they had just house members had just been rushed out and it was just all their stuff. Their belongings had been left in there. And I, I never quite seen that video. And for a moment, I had a hard time imagining it was America. And, and that was helpful because I was like, if an international audience must see that the same way we would see, uh, you know, the things that happen in the Turkish parliament, there's a fist fight or something. But this is far worse than I think I've ever seen in any other countries. Uh, what would you call the equivalent? You know, parliament to parliamentary buildings like I, I don't I can't remember anything. like. And it's, it's it's so weird to think that people don't think that. That's as big of a deal as as anything in our lifetime. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've been watching, you know, presidential inaugurations on TV for years. Right. And I used to I used to sneer at these anchors who would talk about the majesty of the peaceful transfer of power, because, of course, like it's the way the system works. Right. Y- you can't just stay after you lose. Um, and this was an attempt to overturn a presidential election. And we forget about this and we don't, you know, what happened between election day and January 6th was an attempt to overturn the results of an election in which 7 million Americans preferred one candidate over the other. Um, and, what I hope these hearings get at, um, and I think they will, uh, and I hope it registers with the American public, is that the perpetrators of what happened that day, and that day is the tip of the iceberg when you go back over the the planning and the organization that led up to it, um, that the organizers who did this That was a dress rehearsal for what we will see in 2025, Uh, that in many ways, the perpetrators of this insurrection are in a stronger political position today in the states where it matters. And after the 2022 midterms, if they control certain secretaries of state offices, they could be in even stronger position to execute and to actually pull off what they wanted to do with this last election. And that ought to be chilling to us all. There are state legislatures, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, in which I don't have any confidence at all that those state legislatures will certify election results if the Democratic candidate wins. Well, you got the, the same guy in Georgia that's got re- is reelected that would be in charge of it, right? The Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. Uh, the Georgia has done all kinds of new laws in order to limit Raffensperger's power. Um, and there are all kinds of local election boards along the way that before it even gets to the Secretary of State offices, you know, as we saw in Michigan and other states, there's all these local boards that have certification say 
um, this process is also being weaponized against the American people. And we're not, we're not coming to terms with how close it came in 2020 and how much, uh, you know, what was a half-assed conspiracy in many ways in 2020 is going to be a right. full-on organized one with the full weight and credit of the Republican Party behind it in 2024. Okay, uh, well, we'll talk more about that. You and I, I'm sure, lots between now and then, or at least uh, November. But before I let you go, you said I could share that you <laughs> knocked on former Justice Kennedy's home door today. And it's interesting, you went there as a reporter to ask him questions, but it is kind of crazy that today in the news we found out that some guy was was in Justice Brett Kavanaugh's neighborhood uh, with the intention to kill him. And uh, man, your timing was not me. your timing couldn't have been worse if if Kennedy had read the story about Kavanaugh and then then here's a knock at the door. Yeah, my wife texted it to me and she was like, uh, this isn't you, is it? Oh, my God. That's really thoughtful of her. That's very kind. Uh, she knows me. She knows me a little too well, I think. Um, <laughs> You're not a violent man. Um, I'm not. I'm not. Um, uh, no, I had I had only questions for Justice Kennedy. Um, and uh, you can't tell us the questions because it'll give away your book. But but what yeah, I don't want to talk about w- w- what they were exactly. But um, yeah, um, you can knock on someone's door and these justices aren't gods. They ought to have to answer a question when posed by a fellow citizen about about decisions that they make that have had deep consequences for all of us. Is it true that when you opened the door, you said trick or treat? Is that because that seems like a bad opening to me? Uh, well, I had also toilet papered his lawn. So, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, truth of the matter is he was a little out of it. And I mean, he might have thought it was Halloween. It's weird that. Um, it's a former Supreme Court ju- Court Justice opens his own door. I'd never, I'd never opened my door if I were a uh, judge. Uh, he lives in a beautiful, in a beautiful, uh, wealthy community. I don't think there was fair enough. There are many knocks on those doors. If it was Halloween, I was in my Matthew McConaughey ah. outfit, bringing it full circle. You know, no, I mean, I think he probably saw a a harmless balding white man on his on his doorstep and wondered what I was trying to sell him. But he was washing dishes at his at his kitchen sink as I as I looked in. He was he was washing the breakfast dishes, uh, and then he came over and answered the door. Huh? Wow. So you you can't give away. You're going to save it for the book, the uh, exchange. Yeah, I'll save the exchange All for right. the book. I think, but um, he didn't invite you in. Did not invite me in. Okay. Uh, I did not. But I think it's good because he'd already finished with the dishes, and if I'd come in, there would have been coffee, and then there would have been a bigger mess would have had to clean it all up well i look forward to reading more about in the book but that is a fascinating thing that you did today when does the book come out oh gosh uh we're a ways away from that there's there's still a lot of reporting and writing all right well i'm sure it'll be as good as everything else that you've done and i always appreciate when you talk about your work with me here on the podcast david daly everybody always Always a pleasure thank you thank you All right. Thank you very much, David Daly. Go get his books. Go read his articles. Go tweet him. Find all of that information in today's show notes. Do you check out the show notes? If you don't check out the show notes, you really should check out the show notes at David Daly because I put a lot of work into them. You know, I mean, I don't just uh, don't just phone it in. I don't just copy and paste everything. But check out David Daly on Twitter at Dave Daly 3 And, of course, Rick Smith. Go watch and follow everything that Rick is doing, the Rick Smith Show. And thank you to Pete Coe as well as John Carroll for contributing pretty much to every show. Thanks for the emails. Keep them coming. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Send me all of your ideas. Some great guest ideas coming through lately. Keep them coming. Thank you to Mark Nolte, Tina Winsett. Who else had good guest ideas lately? lately? Sorry if I didn't mention your name, but subscribe as well. If you're still listening to me, go to StandUpWithPete.com, StandUpWithPete.com, and subscribe now with a paid subscription for as little as $5. That's all I've got for you. I look forward to seeing you tonight at our watch party at 8 p.m. We will watch the J6 hearings together and chime in and commiserate. Maybe you have some 
special guest, stop in and analyze it. Hope to see you there. Oh, and of course, thank you, and check out our sponsor. It's Indeed.com slash Stand Up. You need to hire new talent, go to Indeed.com slash Stand Up. John Carroll, please take me off this Minecraft hound. Take it from me. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know. It's his time to go. To make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and 